Welcome to Life on Film, a presentation of the National March for Life. I'm Maeve Roach, and with me is Alex Schattenberg, the accompanying producer and director of the film The Euthanasia Deception, in association with Dunn Media. Alex Schattenberg is the executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, which aims to preserve and enforce legal prohibitions and ethical guidelines against the practice of euthanasia, as well as maintaining the dignity and value of lives regardless of age, level of suffering or disability. Alex has even written a book entitled Exposing Vulnerable People to Euthanasia and Assisted Suicide. The Euthanasia Deception is a one hour long documentary featuring powerful testimonies from Belgium and beyond of those devastated by the false ideology of mercy killing. This film offers deep insight into the dangers of accepting euthanasia as a compassionate practice. Thank you for joining us, Alex. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about your background before we commence the movie? Well, I've been the executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition since 1999. So I guess most of my, uh, or large portion of my adult life, I've been working on this issue. And I'm very concerned about this issue because it is about killing. It's about killing people. So when you legalize euthanasia, people would say, you know, it's sold to us about freedom, choice, and autonomy. They're saying, oh, this provides people with the freedom to die and to avoid suffering. And But when you actually look at it, it's not about that at all. It's about giving physicians or others. In Canada, it's also nurse practitioners. So when I say others, it means in a lot of countries, it's, it's other people can do it too. Give them the right in law to cause your death, to kill you. This is about killing people. Now, obviously, my heart goes out to people who are um, going through difficult conditions, but it does not justify killing. We believe in caring for people. We believe in in uh, practices that are evolving and, and growing around how we properly care for people, not to kill them. Uh, society that kills people, you know, the problem with this right from the fundamental issue is once you allow killing, the only question now remaining, because that's the only real line in the sand, the only question now remaining is, who can do it and who will we do it to? That's it. And this is what's being debated now in Canada as they're talking about expanding this. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of your incredible work and in exposing the truth about euthanasia in Canada. Um, after the movie, we will discuss the screening. Um, but Alex, is there anything you would want us to know before we watch this movie? So the Euthanasia Deception is a quite a phenomenal film, and I think it's uh, it's an incredibly powerful film because we went to Belgium to do to get stories about this. And the reason was is at the time we were trying to still warn Canada about what happens when you legalize euthanasia. Well, we know now what is happening in Canada after legalizing euthanasia. So we have several very powerful stories from Belgium. We also had stories from Canada of people who felt that if euthanasia were to be legalized, so this film's now, it was actually came out in 2016, who said that how this would affect them, okay? Uh, some very powerful stories from Belgium include a father who talks about his, his daughter who uh, was born with significant disabilities and how the culture had shifted so much in Belgium that people would approach them and say, why haven't you euthanized your daughter? You know, this would be an unfathomable question to ask someone, and yet somebody would actually think this is a reasonable thing to ask because the culture has shifted and become normalized to euthanasia. You have the story of the of the mother who dies by euthanasia based on depression alone. She was only depressed. She was not sick. She was not ill. And of course, this is the kind of thing we're talking about in Canada now today. I think the euthanasia deception is a powerful, powerful film. And uh, it's certainly being shown all over the world still in countries where they have not legalized euthanasia. And really what's important about also is we were warning Canada and now you see what's happening in Canada. It really does resonate more than ever uh, the power of how this film really had a lot of foresight as to where things were going. Thank you so much, Alex. And to all of our viewers, enjoy the show. My granddad developed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymph cancer at uh, roughly 80 uh, years of age. He was basically killed by the medical staff in the care home. We were making her die because it suited us and it suited her family. On April 19th, 2012, my mother receives a lethal injection in the hospital of the Free University in Brussels. But you had no idea? No. We had a few times when people tried to put us under pressure to have her uh, euthanized. But she, she's just a child like every other child in our family. She was the one going to die, but we were her sons, we loved her. 
and we wanted the best for her. Was there a consensus? There was not a consensus. I was robbed of something like three years of life uh, and contact with my grandfather. We help people to die controlling their suffering and controlling their symptoms. We don't help them to die by killing them. What is our society becoming? It's a quality society. Only the best will survive. The Hippocratic Oath, a document which, for the most part, is still understood by mainstream society as the basis on which healthcare is founded. I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. But since the year 2000, we've seen a radical shift in Western civilization's understanding of compassionate care. What has triggered this massive cultural shift from caring to killing? The whole point comes down to why do people ask for death? And, and the other side wants you to think it's because they're nearing death and they're suffering incredible pain and in fact that represents almost no cases there's so few cases of people who are asking for euthanasia because of uncontrolled suffering physically it has to do usually with a fear of suffering and b i am very emotionally distraught by my situation i was diagnosed with ms when i was 30. at the two to three year point my grief was so deep, my heartache was so sharp, that my thinking became clouded. And if there had been a, a Jack Kevorkian back in the mid-1980s, I can see that I might have opted for that option. I'm so glad today that it did not happen, because I never would have known my grandchildren. You see, the difficulty with making that decision is we're not really sure what tomorrow is going to bring. We make a decision based on the grief of today. I would have, yes, if I hadn't been surrounded by the support and the love of my wife and my children and my, my faith community and my God, I can see that I would have opted for assisted suicide. People are conditioned to think that this is only about terminal illness. This is about dealing with people who are going through the most difficult time of their life. They're at a low time, a human low period. And now we're gonna say we can cause their death when they're at this low time, denying them that ability to come back and feel better about the life that they're living. A lot of people who support assisted suicide say, well, we euthanize our animals. Why shouldn't we do the humane thing for people with disabilities. And my response is to say, the vast majority of animals who are euthanized are abandoned, have behavior problems, are old, are ill, basically unwanted. And that's exactly what happens to humans. The vast majority of people who are euthanized are old, abandoned, unwanted, have behavior problems, are incontinent, and are inconvenient. And I don't want to subject humans to the same treatment that we subject animals to. I have traveled around the world. I have dealt with people across the world on these issues of euthanasia and assisted suicide. This is a worldwide issue. This is an issue now that is being debated in nearly every country in the world. There is pressure now in every jurisdiction of the world to legalize doctors killing their patients by lethal injection. Most doctors want nothing to do with this. Yeah, 
for most of my students, they were four years old when the euthanasia law was voted here in Belgium, so they didn't know anything else. I know that the whole world sees Belgium, maybe even uh, the Netherlands, as uh, ground zero in this. We are living in a culture where death is proposed very easily, where death is considered a solution, a right for everyone who suffers. Now we have it for children, and regardless of their age. It's very frustrating to know why you are here. You are here because we are a study case and because things happen here that may influence the whole world. My mother got sick uh, two years before she died. She had breast cancer, metastasized, and the doctor said we can try this and this and this. She had made up her mind and she didn't want to be a burden on us. She was a, a smart lady reading newspapers all the time and Belgian newspapers bring it out like it's your right. And that's not what it is. It's you can demand for it, you can do a request, and it's up to the doctors to decide along with the patient. So then instead of going for the palliative treatment, she said, I want euthanasia. In Belgium, patients are killed by euthanasia uh, at the first diagnosis of Alzheimer or of a, of a malignant disease of a cancer. More and more people are asking it and obtaining it for non-terminally ill uh, situations. The media here in, in Belgium, they say that the best way of dying is to get euthanasia. That has an impact really on palliative care system because if you are a doctor trying to do your best and if you're in a palliative care unit, if the family is pushing the person to ask for euthanasia, would you go against the family wish? Even in cancer patients, they are asking euthanasia because they have a fear to uh, be suffering. They are discouraged by their disease. It's always for psychological reasons. It's not often for pain or suffocation or other reasons. So my mother went for the the quick way, I wouldn't say the easy way, because finally there was a lot of frustration on her side. This doctor, he said, I want the four of you to tell me what you think about all this. If not all four of you say yes, then we have a problem. She was the one going to die, but we were her sons, we loved her, and we wanted the best for her. Was there a consensus? There was not a consensus. It's that feeling, that society, that makes people having to say yes to euthanasia in their relatives, the relatives they love and that they have a hard time to say goodbye to. The four of us sat there, and that was a very intense moment for us. She sat there, and that's when we start bringing up memories. Sadly, but it came a bit late, I think. She even kept talking while having the IV. So we had a good last one hour of talking, and that was it. And I regret my mother had a treatment on that level. I think she and all the other people dying deserve more. We owe it to them. Palliative care begins with the diagnosis that will eventually take your life. And it doesn't mean that you're going to die next week. It doesn't just involve the patient, it involves um, their families, all of their caregivers, and a support system is put in place that we can allow everyone to die with as little pain as possible, with dignity and with peace. No, yeah. There is no physical pain that cannot be managed. Even people who vote for the legalization of euthanasia and who are strongly in support of euthanasia are in agreement with me. Pain can be controlled. I think that we can manage 
all suffering with palliative care, including palliative sedation. Palliative sedation means that the patient is put into a sleep, a deep sleep. He's not reacting anymore. He does not feel the pain anymore. He's not conscious anymore. He does not feel asphyxia anymore. And this is a method to control all his symptoms. In 25 years, at least, I really haven't seen anyone die in excruciating pain unless they chose not to have any medication. And you've got to realize that some people don't want medication. The, the essential point here is unbearable pain. And in Belgium, who decides what pain is unbearable? The patient decides. So for example, we've had a case of a man of 45 who had the beginning of multiple sclerosis and who has been euthanized before being in the terminal state of his uh, illness. Uh, he could have lived 10, 15 years uh, with his illness because he said it was unbearable for him to depend on others. He could not live with the fact of having others uh, help him, wash him, etc., uh, etc. Et and so he had euthanasia. But euthanasia is like a false answer. Um, it destroys everything. In families, people might disagree on it. Can you imagine how the family stays after and how to grave after? Those last few months may offer opportunities to heal a wound that may be decades old with a son or a father or a friend. It allows individuals to quietly and tenderly speak to the individual who is about to have their life end. It is a sacred time that never involves killing. A 72-year-old patient was suffering breast cancer and indeed she, was, she had been treated for several years and the therapy was not so efficient anymore. So I went to see her, I took half an hour to talk to her, to listen to her and I asked her, why are you asking for euthanasia? Well, this uh, therapy is too heavy for me and I don't want to be a burden for my family. Then I told her, indeed, this therapy is too heavy for you. It's not helping you anymore. We can stop it. It's not a problem to stop it. And then concerning the burden for your family, in fact, her daughter was present in the room. Uh, I told her, well, did you take care once in your life for someone? And she said, yes, my father was sick during five years and I took care of him at home when he was ill during that period. And then when he died, my mother became ill and I took care of her during six months. And I asked her, well, was this heavy for you to take care? Was this a burden for you? Oh no, it was such a pleasure to take care of them. It, I was so happy to do so. And before I could say, well, now this is the moment then maybe that others can take care of you and feel happy to take care of you. The daughter took the feet of the patient, started crying and told mommy, let me please take care of you now. And the question for euthanasia was solved. There was no question anymore, no demand anymore. And so if you can see that you can help persons to live their death in a good way or their disease in a good way, well, this is for me very grateful. This was our first confrontation with the monster I call euthanasia. We were walking with our child in, 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 in her uh, wheelchair, doing walks, and we would have people that we did not, do not know, which are completely strangers to us, and they would come towards us, and they would ask us, why don't you have euthanasia with that child? And my daughter, who was 13 at the time, she said, they do not have the right to say that. She was very angry. But she was right. I don't know any person with a disability who has not been told by friends, by family, by medical professionals, and by strangers that they would rather be dead than be like that person. She needs more time, of course. Some days it's difficult. Some days it's, it's more easy. But she, she's just a child like every other child in our family. And every one of the other children cares about her. She doesn't speak a word. She might understand six words, but we always say, she's like a baby. 
it's a big baby, <laughs> but she's like a baby. And she is happy to be alive. She's a joy for every one of our family members. We, we cannot imagine her being gone. Impossible. Thank God for the tikvas in this world. I speak because I am a person with a disability. I am a person who is endangered by these laws, just like every other person with a disability. It's not us and them. I include every other person because disability is a group that anybody can join at any moment. Whether or not somebody who comes down with cancer or ALS or MS or Alzheimer's wants to admit it, they have a disability and they fall into that group. And so this isn't an us or them question, this is an all of us question. If today someone is neither intelligent, nor beautiful, nor rich, how is he seen through the eyes of many people? We are in a society that wants to have a new race and everything which does not fit into the perfect image of what that race would be today has to be eliminated. If you would ask me when I was 25, what gave my life quality? Well, it was being athletic, being involved with my family, having an upwardly mobile career. If you said to me within a few years, you will be in a wheelchair, you'll lose your career, you won't be able to do many of the physical things that you like to do. I would have said there's no quality of life in that. And yet today, at 62, my life does have quality. Why the change? Quality of life is a moving target. It changes over time. What gave my life quality back then was the ability to do things. What gives my life quality now is to love and to be loved and to still make a contribution, as small as it may be. Recently, euthanasia has been extended to children, young people, without limit of age. You know, any child who is judged to be conscious and capable by a, by a physician has the right to ask for euthanasia and get it with the authorization of his or her parents. It's like a thick black blanket that has descended on the country of Belgium. And that blanket is called euthanasia. It's our answer to help them kill themselves. Is that where we have come as a society? Have we come to the point where we will not embrace even the broken? We only want the winners in our society. So what citizens get suicide prevention and what citizens get assisted suicide? I can tell you who it is. People like me get assisted suicide. My healthy neighbor gets suicide prevention. Where's the equality in that? Where's the value, of equal value of individuals in that? Sure, people want to die when they're, they're in their deepest crisis, but we don't help them kill themselves. We surround them with the love of a community. We try and help them find meaning and purpose in their lives again, even when they have lost sight of their own purpose. There are really very few people who are requesting to die because of pain. The vast majority of people who are requesting to die is because of disability. If you look behind me, there is a bust of Ludwig von Beethoven. His beautiful Fifth Symphony was written in serious deafness. He contemplated killing himself. He knew he was going deaf, and yet, look at what this deaf composer gave to the vast treasury of human music. Can you imagine if he'd been alive today and had voiced his desire to die? We would have lost all that. Never assume that we have nothing left to give. We want to speak from a place of strength, and that's why we're saying we're not dead yet. This isn't just a debate among bioethicists, academicians, doctors, religious people. This is a debate that concerns people with disabilities because virtually every person who is given assisted suicide has a disability, whether or not they want to admit it. And so we need to say that we are not dead yet. We're not going quietly into this gentle night.
On April 19th, 2012, my mother receives a little injection in the Hospital of the Free University in Brussels. But you had no idea? No. At school, I had a lecture in the afternoon and my wife emailed me that I had to phone to the Hospital of the University of Brussels uh, because my mother was dead. I was in complete shock. My mother was physically healthy. I mean, she was going in and out of depressions all her life, but is this a reason for it in Asia? Yeah, apparently it is. My mother died with pictures of me and her grandchildren in her hands. Well, the law says that nobody has to be aware of the demand of the patient. It's only the patient who will decide. After my mother died, I went to speak with the euthanasia team who approved the euthanasia request of my mother and the physician who gave my mother a lethal injection. The physician said that they had discussed the procedure a lot of times and he was certain that my mother didn't want to live anymore and that it was okay to give her the lethal injection. In effect, that was it. No fuss. Did she have the right then? Yeah, this is the law. As a mother, it wasn't only her quality of life, it was also the quality of life of her own grandchildren. Oh, the person says it's my choice. Let me tell you something about it's my choice. Choices never affect just the individual. If I choose suicide, assisted or otherwise, it doesn't affect just Mark. It will affect my wife, my children, my grandchildren. It will affect my doctor because I'll ask her to stop being my healer and become my killer. We are not alone in this world and what people may say, whatever they want to say, we are not alone in this world. So if you're going to be a fundamentalist, autonomous person, you are way away from, from your responsibilities. So that's one big risk on euthanasia, is that the pain is stopped in the person that did, that's obvious. But if you're bringing the pain over to other people, then you're not doing a good thing. Not as a government allowing such euthanasias, and definitely not as a doctor who stops one pain and transplants it to another generation. In the end, they showed no empathy at all for my pain. They showed no empathy for what I had to go through. And it's even worse. I think that the physician who killed my mother, he has a big, big responsibility towards me and towards my children and towards my sister. It is the fundamental philosophical question that is evoked in all of the debates. That is the right to autonomy, the right to choose for oneself. But it must be well noted that this definitely has an impact on the overall concept of medicine. La conception que l'on se fait collectivement de la médecine. We are not fully autonomous. We are always depending from other persons who can help us and, and who are also expecting something from us. My granddad developed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymph cancer at uh, roughly 80 years of age. I have a sister who is a um, physician. She's a medical doctor. She lives in the United States now. Uh, and I phoned her up uh, when I'd heard that granddad had uh, non-Hodgkin's cancer and asked her uh, what the prognosis was for somebody roughly 80 years old who was just in the starting phase, the early phase of non-Hodgkin's cancer. And she estimated that he would have had probably about three years. Um, the first year and a half would probably have been reasonable in terms of comfort. The, the last phase would have been painful. I remember being uh, surprised at how lethargic he was. He, he couldn't articulate properly because his tongue was swollen up. Now these are typical symptoms of morphine overdose. By Thursday of that week, an aunt of mine uh, was visiting uh, him and she was giving him some water and one of the nursing staff came by and said to, to her, don't do that, you're prolonging the process of his dying. And she said, what?
I was robbed of something like three years of life uh, and contact with my grandfather. Once that you will admit that a doctor can kill his patient, even if it is in terminally uh, situations, in terminal conditions, it will be very difficult to put um, a, a red line and to say you cannot go beyond this because what is a terminally ill situation? How can you judge if a patient will still live three days, three weeks, three months? I have done this for 20 years. I have done this to people for 20 years. I had um, a patient in in a nursing home, and she she was um, admitted under palliative care, but she got better. And then she was a, then she went back under palliative care, and she got better. And then she started looking like she might die, so my nurse came to me and said, "Let's get orders." get the show on the road. We don't want to let it get to the point where she's dying and then she bounces. We want her to just, just die. It was the way we all thought and I thought so too. So we got the orders for her and they put them in, got everything going. It should take 24, maybe 48 hours for the person to die and she didn't. I came back in on Monday and she was still, she was still alive. And I read the notes and the one nurse, that the night nurse, Saturday night, she wrote, what are we doing here? And that stuck with me and I thought, what are we doing here? Are we helping someone die or are we making someone die? We were making her die because it suited us. And it suited her family. It took nine days for her to finally die. It's always meant with good intentions. To see someone in so much pain that you just want to end it for them. But there are other ways to get rid of the pain. Never once did we think, oh, maybe there's something wrong with our palliative care. Maybe there's something wrong with our pain control. It was always, let's just hurry and end this. And, and that's not right. I was so wrong. I was so wrong. It, no, it's not too much to sum up. I killed people. When the physician spoke to my grandmother, he said something to the effect of, well, you know, we're going to have to treat his pain very seriously. Uh, is that okay? And my grandmother, who had a high respect for the medical profession, said, well, whatever is good. You know, you do, you do what needs doing. She didn't mean kill him and she was mortified by the outcome. I mean, this was so damaging to her that she couldn't talk about the event for years afterwards. Modern medicine does provide us with many means of keeping people alive for a very long time. Sometimes it is appropriate to withhold or withdraw that treatment, not to hasten death, but just to make their life more comfortable. And this allows them to die a natural death. Withdrawing or withholding treatment is not the same as causing death. What's wrong with hastening is you don't know what you're hastening them from. You don't know if they're gonna get better. You don't know if this isn't their time to die. Or what if it is, but not until a week from now? There is something wrong fundamentally with taking another human being's life. With your eyes wide open to what you're doing, 
they have entrusted you with their life and you take it. Nobody asked him whether this was what he wanted or whether that was okay. You know, the, the sense of loss and the depth with which this, this cut into to the family was, was immeasurable. I left my job as a nurse because I could not be a part of that euthanizing culture that we have. Proper palliative care strives to eliminate the pain, but never the patient. We never withhold food or fluids when someone is, is in the end stages of life. We just don't do it. We offer it. We don't insist that they eat. We don't try to, you know, shove it down their throat, but we never withhold it. One of the reasons to legalize in Belgium was the fact that euthanasia was already happening. But now what you see is that up to 40% of the cases in Belgium, so we are talking about 1,000 cases every year, three each day, are not declared. And there is no control of the, of the law. It is a system of self-reporting, which is to say that it is the doctor himself who fills out the paperwork. Naturally, the doctor will state that there was a voluntary request for euthanasia, and he will indicate that the person was suffering unbearably. Clearly, he will not want to be subject to questioning from the law. Are the doctors who caused the death going to self-report if they abused the law? Are they going to write on, on, the, on the report, oh, you know, the patient was really, really, really depressed, really seemed to need good care for their depression, but they did have cancer, and probably were within six months of death, so I guess it was okay. Are they gonna write that? Of course not. They're gonna say the patient had cancer, was within six months of death, and was approved by two doctors. Et donc pour cela que... And it is for this reason that in 14 years, there has only been one case of euthanasia that has been reported by the governing board to the court of law. One of the main promoters of euthanasia in Belgium, and who was a promoter of the law, he is now telling everywhere that he's not declaring anymore his cases because he's considering this as a normal medical act. So he does not see the importance to, to declare uh, his cases to the commission who is evaluating euthanasia. This is a clear uh, problem uh, with the law, this is illegal, but still this man is not uh, pursued for this. Should we not be concerned that in Belgium where they've legalized euthanasia that you have over 1,000 deaths in 2013 alone in that Flanders region which are hastened without request and they tend to be people who had Alzheimer's, dementia, incompetent to make decisions for themselves? So we created a free guide for physicians who are willing to kill and we have created many more problems, ethically. The Belgian law provides that it must be a grave sickness that is incurable, which results in both physical and mental suffering. But one must realize that with time the framework of euthanasia is broadening. For example, people who are in a state of depression even recently, we had the case of a person in a reactive depression. She suffered the loss of her daughter. And a couple of months later, she requested euthanasia and she was granted it. So this person did not have a physical sickness. Under the rubrics of psychological suffering, euthanasia becomes open for any and all condition. Because all of us will psychologically suffer in some way related to our medical conditions. It's just a normal human reality. The law is based completely on autonomy. It is strange because at the same time they don't respect the autonomy of doctors and they even don't respect the autonomy of institutions who don't want to choose for euthanasia. They are saying that 
euthanasia should be much more easy to apply. They are saying that when someone studies to become a doctor, they should learn about euthanasia. So every doctor should be able to give euthanasia, although law says that doctors can choose to, to give it euthanasia or not. And they also think that euthanasia should be in the package of information that we give to patients. Referring is for me the same like doing it yourself. I mean, if you have some problem with your conscience and you are convinced that euthanasia is not a good solution for the doctors, the patient, the family, well, you tell this to the patient, you will propose him alternative solutions but then if he insists and you say, well, then I will call a colleague and he will do it for in my place, it's like collaborating to euthanasia. And when we suggest other options, it can be very difficult to explain why. Because the discussion becomes difficult. The patient says, I have the right to euthanasia and I choose that path. I do not want to discuss it any further. We had one patient who was asking for euthanasia. Uh, he was at the beginning of his cancer treatment and I told him that I did not want to do euthanasia in his case uh, for personal reasons, but also that we were treating him and that there were other solutions, etc. etc. And he was not so happy with my answer. And then afterwards his wife came to knock on the door of the doctor's room and she was like agitated, a bit upset, and she said, uh, did you talk to my husband some minutes ago? I said, yes, I did. He asked you for euthanasia. Yes, yes, he did. And you refused. I said, well, I offered him other solutions, and you are a good doctor, because five years ago I had a cancer myself, and I was struggling to fight this disease and to overcome it, and I overcome the disease. Now I'm, I'm healthy. It is not the physical pain that counts in euthanasia cases. It is more about suffering or making sense out of an end-of-life situation or when one is living in a life that is hard to bear. So if you have no quality of life anymore, oh, you know there is a solution for that. So we need quality of life. And if you haven't any quality of life anymore, we give you, if you want, of course, and you're free to ask it, we can give you a lethal injection. Tikva has been a, a testimony to us. If today you go through Belgium, you will not see many young children that have a handicap because they were not left to be alive. The reason for her to be alive and to have a right to live is because she's a creation. Nothing more and nothing less. We will become more and more vulnerable as a result of the legalization of euthanasia. Certain people believed that any suffering that could not be cured should result in killing someone in order to relieve them of their suffering, which is completely false because no beautiful words, no precise act like this, even if it is spectacular, will ever make suffering disappear. What is our society becoming? It's a quality society. Only the best will survive. The law should be rewritten. The law should be severely questioned and should be rewritten. If I have a message to other countries who would be tempted to open the door of euthanasia, I would say don't open the door because it is not controllable. The door is open, it will go more and more wide open. They should invest a huge budget in palliative care, in uh, the formation of volunteers, because unbearable pain is a very relative uh, concept. We've had a protection against physicians killing people for more than 2,000 years because of the, the Hippocratic tradition. 
And we have now arrived at a moment in history when we've opened Pandora's box and the inevitable danger is that physicians become a threat to their patients. They give lectures at schools and about euthanasia. And in the school agenda of my daughter, eight years old, there was a flyer of an euthanasia, a lecture euthanasia, with the killer of my mother in her school agenda. And the ethics teacher said, yeah, but it was, uh, it, it was not meant for the children, it was meant for the parents. So I call this indoctrination. I think this is insane. Laws have a task. They tell people if something is good or is not good. And the moment the euthanasia law was voted, the state officially said euthanasia from today on is something good. What I do see now is we are now having a dogma where you can't discuss euthanasia openly and if you're doing it then they will judge you and they will try to get rid of you and I truly think that this has nothing to do with medicine. By opening the possibility of euthanasia you open a sense of burden. You see before it becomes a legal option Caring for somebody who needs care is just the human thing you do. But once they have the opportunity to choose to let their lives be ended, they're not doing so is to choose to burden their next of kin. That's unfair. Don't be made to think it's the right thing. Because it's not. It's not. I've been able-bodied most of my life until just this summer in um, August 31st. I had a stroke. <laughs> I was out like in a coma for about 10 days and I was on a ventilator and life support. I was taken up and I see bed for 10 days and they didn't know if I was gonna wake up or not. If you don't have someone willing to fight for you, then you're at the whim on, of somebody's political leanings. If it wasn't for my husband being the one that was speaking for me, and saying what I wanted and what he wanted. I wouldn't be here today. I remember going to physiotherapy every day for hours a day. Mm, my feelings have been just up and down through this whole thing. Those thoughts of killing myself, they entered my mind, but I don't know, there's something about it I just shied away from. I wouldn't have thought that I could come through like so well. And it amazes me how, how many people around the world go through things like this. And how many of them have the strength and the courage to wake up and get going with their life. Growing up in a dysfunctional household, I ended up with PTSD and severe depression in addition to my legal blindness. And in terms of assisted suicide and euthanasia, that is where I feel particularly vulnerable because there are times when I feel like I'd rather be dead. And I understand that that is a dysfunction in my brain that is telling me that, and so I have enough insight to, to control my response to it, but that doesn't mean I don't feel that way. And I am afraid that sometime I will go to a psychiatrist who will say, well, gee, I can understand why you would feel like that because I'd rather be dead than be disabled and that such laws would endanger people like me. It's been seven months now or eight almost. I still get depressed and yeah, it's still pretty challenging. I often feel like, you know, um, 
why did I, why did I live? But there's a reason for it. I'm glad I'm alive for this. These impassioned testimonies and perspectives should be enough to convince anyone, on either side of the issue, to stop and ponder the serious, long-term implications that euthanasia laws impose on society. The government sees us as its children, but now it no longer wants to look after its children, it wants to euthanize them, because it's cheaper. But in order to kill me, you have to program society to believing that it is a loving and a merciful and a compassionate act. Once you start causing the death of your patients, you start lethally injecting your patients, it changes everything. Once somebody who has cerebral palsy has been lethally injected by their physician, the next time that physician has a patient with cerebral palsy, what is that physician thinking? Euthanasia is now obviously an option. It's not just an option, it's a serious suggestion. Once someone has a serious case of cancer, is lethally injected, there will be many patients with a serious case of cancer. If they could brainwash the public to believe that it was a loving and a compassionate act to kill, they would win the debate, and they have done so. Safeguards have not been effective in jurisdictions where assisted suicide is now legal. They won't be effective here. And so it, it depends on the supports you get. And this is why this issue is so dangerous. Because if you remove the supports, if you put people on the emotional ledge, so to speak, well, sure, they're going to jump off. If they feel like nobody cares, I'm fortunate that I have two or three people that I just have to make a phone call to and they'll say, Steve, whatever you need. And that's how you defeat this issue. I think that people don't see the impact of euthanasia on our society. The person asking in the name of autonomy for euthanasia, I would say it is a narrow-minded, narrow-minded request. And what I would like to tell those people is that we can take care of you. We need to take care of you. We are able to control virtually all pain, if properly dealt with. We need to improve end-of-life training, pain management care, in our medical schools, in our nursing programs across the country. We can offer complete relief. Such an approach demonstrates great respect for the patient. With this support, we address their emotional, physical, spiritual, social well-being so that they don't feel abandoned, they don't feel as if they need to ask for someone to end their life. In our daily lives, we live in superficiality. And I think that for me, it is important to learn how to love. And the best way to learn how to love is to not be afraid to face the difficulty of our humanity. To say there is someone with me and we will get through this together. Joy comes from the discovery that this is true. The word mercy, if you, if you trace it back, it means in Latin to be with. We do not get our value by what we can do. To be is what gives us meaning. To be able to be a part of a community, to enhance someone else's reality as they enhance ours, and bring us into their community. I can certainly tell you about a little lady who was, was dying and her family was at the bedside and her young granddaughter, perhaps in her late teens, early 20s, crawled into bed with grandma, held her in her lap and cradled her and rocked her. She said, my grandma always did this for me. I'm doing it for her. 
and what a beautiful way to pass with dignity and that lady wasn't in pain and she knew she was loved. We help people to die controlling their suffering and controlling their symptoms. We don't help them to die by killing them. What does true compassion mean? True compassion means that we journey with the other. We recognize that the other is my brother or my sister. The other is important to me because we share the common community. We share life together. The end result of this whole question is, do I love you enough to care for you when you are going through the most difficult time of your life? Because if I do, I'm going to somehow be able to say to you, you're important to me. I will be there with you. Welcome back everyone to our interview portion. I hope that you were all touched by the film. My first question for you, Alex, is what did you hope would be the biggest takeaway from the film? I think the stories in the film are very powerful. And it really does tell us because we're talking about real life human beings and their stories. So you see the story, uh, you hear Mark Pickup talking about his life experience as a person with a disability. I think it's very powerful because these are lived experience. You see Christina Hodges talking about what she was doing as a nurse and how it was wrong. And this is the kind of thing that's becoming normalized now in Canada. It's becoming more and more common. And the media is celebrating this now. But this is a film that was telling us this is where it's going. So obviously speaking, I think these stories are very powerful. But it also tells us the importance of stories for fighting euthanasia now. A lot of people are, uh, how would you say, they're lulled into thinking that this is just um, okay. and Or they might think, well, you know, maybe this isn't the best idea, but, you know, I wouldn't want to suffer. And so they, they're dealing with their fears and saying maybe this is a good idea. So if you out there have a story to share about a personal experience related to this issue of euthanasia, assisted suicide, you should share it with us. We need these stories in order to help warn society or at least, how would you say, create a sort of a pushback against this culture of euthanasia that's going on right now, this culture of death. And you can send stories to me at info at epcc.ca, info at epcc.ca. Thank you, and I couldn't agree more. Um, after the recent passing of the Canadian euthanasia bill, Bill C-7, this heart-wrenching film has become increasingly prevalent. What have um, the viewers been saying about the film yep. and what has been its impact um, for its audience in recent and past events? Well, this film has been very effective. The euthanasia deception, uh, a few years ago, we were contacted by somebody in the U.S., and uh, he had the youth, he knew the euthanasia prevention, uh, the euthanasia deception was being screened. So his grandmother, who was pro euthanasia, pro assisted suicide, who had said that this is how she would want to die, she had been a member of one of the uh, pro euthanasia lobby groups in the U.S. She had uh, he took her with her him to see the euthanasia deception, and after seeing the film, she completely changed her mind. So we have stories like that, and this is very powerful because when they're actually hearing about somebody's personal experience, it changes their mind as to what this is about. For instance, the one story in the euthanasia deception of the man who has his his face sort of covered and everything, like we he didn't want to be uh, interviewed in, in public in a sense, so he agreed. To be interviewed where you couldn't tell who he was and he was talking about how this affected his family and this is a man in belgium how his mother died by euthanasia and how this caused a great problem in the family and how it wasn't necessary if she had had palliative care good care care she would not have chosen euthanasia and these are the kind of stories we have to understand how this affects the individuals remember he's talking now about his 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 uh feelings after the death and what happened in the same way with uh, with Tom Mortier in uh, in Belgium talking about the death of his mother, who only was depressed. She was not she was not ill. She was not suffering physical illness. She was depressed, and uh, she, and that's a, a long story. But he's still battling this today in the courts, trying to get uh, the truth out about what happened to his mother. But the fact is, is it it, it makes us understand. Well, why would they kill his mother if she wasn't really sick at all? 
And, and how did they come to these decisions? And this is a very important thing to understand that really when you legalize euthanasia, it's about killing people. This is what it's about. This is about the rules that we follow for killing people. It's not about freedom, choice, and autonomy. That's just the flag we wave to make people feel better. It's not about medical aid in dying because that, oh, that makes me feel good. It's we're aiding people in dying. No, it's about killing people. And um, say it any way you want. It's always wrong to be killing people. It's never a good idea to be killing people. Yeah, it's truly heartbreaking, um, and especially during this trying time when vulnerable people are offered death instead of health care by our government. Um, how can Canadians and people around the world get involved in the prevention of euthanasia and assisted suicide? Well, as I already mentioned, the importance of stories, because stories help people uh, understand it in their own personal life experience. But I think what happens is people have to really know how to uh, fight back about this, because, uh, you know, we're being told uh, a bill of goods, which are not true at all. I always say to people, when you're talking about euthanasia and assisted suicide, we actually have to talk about what it is. The problem in the culture is we've been inundated with ideas about what people want it to be. They're in feel like it's normal for a human being to be in fear of pain. It's normal for a human being to think, oh, you know, I wouldn't want to die that way or to have all these sort of inner feelings. That's all normal. I understand people thinking there might be an easier way out. Well, we don't have to suffer like that. This, this is certainly not necessary. We could properly care for people. We believe in caring for people, not killing people. But the fact is, when you legalize this, what does it actually mean? What does it actually do? And when you look at the language of the legislation, for instance, in Canada's own law, the original law said you could have euthanasia, but your natural death would have to be reasonably foreseeable. Well, what did it mean that your natural death had to be reasonably foreseeable? They allow euthanasia in Canada for physical or psychological suffering, and they've now opened that up to mental illness. But what does it mean, psychological suffering? The language of the bill is not defined. It's simply not defined. So what you have is this growth of killing. It grows because you didn't define it. If it's not defined, then it becomes defined by its practice. And that's what we're experiencing right now in Canada. So right now, for instance, Ireland has been considering euthanasia. And I wrote an article about that for the Irish people. And I was in, I was uh, uh, speaking to one of their conferences and I was online because I'm in Canada and, you know, we've gone through a pandemic, so you can't go to Ireland. But nonetheless, the point is, is that uh, I was pointing out to them the language of your bill. The language is very similar to the Canadian language. It is not defined. Therefore, what they're saying to you is a lie. They're saying, oh, we're going to have a little bit of euthanasia just for those few cases of people that are suffering. No, you didn't define the bill. So therefore, by not defining the language, you're creating an expansive situation. And that's what we saw in the Netherlands and Belgium. That's what we have in Canada. And that's what they're going to have in Ireland if they actually sadly do the same thing. They haven't done it yet. And, I, and I'm really hoping that they're able to stop this situation. So here in Canada, the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, we're involved worldwide. One of the things that's happened with the legalization of euthanasia in Canada, that it's gone so fast, the expansion, like um, the uh, the Canadian public, the media, the government has so become so pro-euthanasia. I'm really now referring to the media and, the, and this current government is that, in fact, what's happened is, is that um, we have become – Sadly, the ultimate example of, quote, quote, the slippery slope or inc incremental extensions and what happens with this. I'm sad to say that one of the most effective ways to stop euthanasia expansion worldwide is to point to Canada. I'm sad to say that because I'm a Canadian. I'm sad to say that because I'm involved in the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition as a leader here in Canada. But it, it wasn't me who did this. Uh, the fact of it is, is this is what exists um, so sharing our stories out of Canada are very important because it does affect the rest of the world. We have thousands of, of supporters worldwide who are looking for the information out of Canada in order to fight it in other places. Yeah, thank you so much. And I really do think there is such a deep beauty in global unity, especially on life issues. Um, and I'm sure many of your viewers are wondering where can they screen this film on their own time? Well, if you contact the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, actually, lately we've had a, a program going on, and, and uh, we, we've been promoting that again. Is the uh, you know, if you make a donation to Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, we'll send you a free screening link to the Euthanasia uh, Deception. But on top of it, um, 
we do have copies of the euthanasia deception and they can be then shown at groups, etc., youth groups, churches, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. And uh, there's a package that goes with it of information, questions, answers, and things like that for a discussion session. But there's also the other film, the film Fatal Flaws. So you have, there's the two films that actually work as a great compendium. Like they work together very well. And Fatal Flaws is a little different than euthanasia deception. Euthanasia deception was based on, on Belgium, and Canada, stories out of Belgium and stories out of Canada. And you can see that now they've watched it, right? Uh, but uh, Fatal Flaws was based on the Netherlands and the United States. Now we do have one story out of Canada in Fatal Flaws. But once again, these films are based on story model. And the reason is, is that uh, most people, humans, we react emotionally and we react to the real story, the human experience. We can then feel connected to that human experience. And this is why these films are so powerful. As I already said, Euthanasia Deception has been incredibly successful. And uh, simply by contacting the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, now you can uh, you can Google us. We're easy to find. Or you can email me at info at epcc.ca. But we, uh, we basically send out links to the Euthanasia Deception to people who make a donation of any amount. And the reason we do that is uh, the films were produced for what reason? To be seen, to be shared. Um, that's why donors of our organization gave money so that this would exist as a resource for people to show to others. Great. And we will provide all those links in the description as well as your email address um, so that people can enjoy and yeah. share this film after the screening. May I ask now, what are your current campaigns or projects, especially in light of Bill C-7? Well, Bill C-7 has changed everything, but the government has started a five-year review of our euthanasia legislation. And this is a very difficult situation because the original law, which was passed in June 2016, it had in Section 10 of that law a requirement that the government begin a review of the law starting in June of 2020. Never happened. Hmm. Instead, the government was expanding the law without reviewing the law. Now they finished expanding the law even before reviewing it, which seems to be a little backwards, but I guess that's what happens in this sort of a government. And uh, now they're going to review the law. Uh, my fear is, of course, that the purpose of the review is further expansions. We have to, we, you know, we've worked on a major document. Um, we hired someone who's gone through all the media and has really put together a, a phenomenal document of information about what's actually happened in Canada because the media isn't reporting it. So the only way you're going to find out about it is if we put it together in a, in a document. And so this is the one thing we've been doing is to bring these stories together, but we need more stories. On this. Now, second thing is, of course, conscience rights continue to be an important issue. Now, why? Physicians are being pressured. We're going to more and more lose good physicians in Canada because they're being pr pressured to participate in this. And a lot of them are saying, I want nothing to do with this. I'm not going to kill my patients. I don't want to refer them to a killer. I don't want to be part of this. I don't believe in this. This is wrong. And yet they're being told, well, you're going to have to do an effective referral, which means a referral for the purpose of the act. Well, if I'm not willing to kill you, then I'm not willing to send you to the killer. We have a serious problem in Canada because we're not protecting our healthcare providers who don't want to participate. So what ends up happening is if we, if we can't somehow create some protections for our physicians, we will lose in Canada these good physicians. They will leave our country or retire early. And why? Well, because they can go anywhere in the world and be a physician and care for people and do what they were called to do and not have to worry about their conscience protections. But here in Canada, they have to worry about their conscience protections. Now for people in Manitoba, uh, Manitoba does have conscience rights, uh, but the rest of Canada for the most part does not. And Ontario is the worst jurisdiction in the world on this. And uh, this is something that has to be reversed. Uh, for me, as a human being, I want to go to a doctor who I know will not kill me. And the only way that's gonna happen is if those doctors continue to exist in Ontario where I live. If they all leave and work in South Dakota where they know that in South Dakota there's sick people also, but they won't be pressured to, to do something they believe is wrong, then guess what? I will not have a physician to go to in Ontario, uh, not because there aren't physicians, but because there aren't physicians willing not to kill me. And this is the reality. And why am I so concerned about that? Because as a human being, 
I'm just as emotional and psychologically affected as the next person. I can't be assured that in my deep, dark time of my life, I might also feel a loss of hope. The problem with euthanasia is we're all human. You've legalized killing. You've given doctors the right and law to do it. And then as human beings, we are fallible. We go through these situations of deep depression. Many of us feel a loss of hope at times. Uh, we feel no purpose in our life anymore. We're going through a difficult time. We become so darkened by our situation that the blinders are on and we can't see beyond that anymore. And who's going to protect us then? I need a physician who won't kill me. And you need a physician who won't kill you. So that's why conscience rights are important, because why would a physician stay in Ontario and then have to go before some board to defend their medical license because they won't kill their patients? What about the Delta hospice in, in, a, in Delta, BC, that was taken over by the BC government because they refused to kill their patients? This is the kind of thing that's going on in Canada, which is quite insane, in, in fact, and that, that's what it is. Uh, let's call it what it is. It's insanity. And uh, we need to try and reverse that, at least by protecting our physicians, minimally speaking. Yeah, I absolutely couldn't agree more. My life so and your life might depend on that. <laughs> Definitely. <Yeah. laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Um, as we can, we also continue to commend your incredible work um, to preserve the value and the dignity of human life from conception till natural death. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. This was Life on Film with Alex Schattenberg. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.